This is um, not the first time I'm uh, speaking at this conference. Actually, the, the first time is exactly, uh, I think, 10 years ago uh, here in New York City also, um, when I gave um, a keynote speech on uh, a very similar topic, uh, the, the future of the high-rise. And uh, back then I presented a, a series of projects, um, some of which uh, never saw the uh, light of day. Uh, some of which uh, exist today um, and stand. Um, and uh, for, for a long time, I've been very uh, interested in this typology, um, but not uh, to simply embrace it uh, in its uh, bare existence, but really to ask the question, um, how could we think differently about the skyscraper and what kind of uh, prototypes could we create um, to give this um, building type uh, a new sense and a new life? This project um, was what I presented uh, indeed 10 years ago, um, and in a way it was um, the hypothesis of an anti-skyscraper, uh, where of course um, verticality is what dominates this typology uh, almost in its entirety, and our proposition at the time was to say, could we think about something that is not about hierarchy and verticality with the top always the best, the bottom the worst, and could we actually um, think of a skyscraper as a different spatial typology um, that would uh, uh, kind of join the needle back into itself, convert it into a loop of interconnected activities? And this is the building uh, as it stands uh, since 2008, um, completed from its exterior, uh, th since 2010, um, completed from the interiors and broadcasting live since 2012. It is uh, China's national uh, television station, CCTV, in Beijing. It is, to our knowledge, still, still one of the largest buildings ever built, with uh, 473,000 square meters without a single expansion joint, um, a structure that uh, I think um, has rewritten not only spatially, but also structurally um, a lot of what was uh, uh, considered possible with a skyscraper. This building was uh, also honored by the um, Council of Tall Building in 2013 as um, the world's best tall building. Um, and uh, a second project um, that brought me back uh, basically a year later is another, if you like, anti-skyscraper. The first one, uh, a place of work. The second one, a place to live. Um, this is a picture of Singapore where the interlace is located. And like much of uh, Asia and more and more of the world, um, our cities and our lives are dominated indeed by verticality, uh, often in most cases by a very generic sense of simple extrusions um, that I feel uh, pose a very uh, critical question, namely how do we live together and not isolated from each other? The kind of silo effect of the skyscraper is something that I believe is a question that we have to deal with intensely and find ways to reconnect, in a way, the building of this scale um, to, uh, to not only the city but also the inhabitants themselves. Um, the project brief foresaw with a 24-story height limit stipulated by the planning authorities um, essentially uh, a little forest of 12 towers of 24 floors to accommodate uh, 1,040 apartment units we were asked to design. And instead of uh, subscribing um, to this typology, I wanted to um, explore a possibility to generate the same density of urban living in a completely different uh, way. So I basically took the towers and toppled them, threw them to their side, and stack them up in what you only comprehend from the helicopter view um, in a hexagonal grid to create giant outdoor courtyards and ultimately a system of interconnected living that was much more about a sense of community um, than uh, a sense of pure isolation of the tower. This project um, received the inaugural uh, Urban Habitat Award of the Council in uh, 2014, last year, um, and uh, of course, it's an honor, uh, in a way, to be back uh, to present a project that I think in many ways um, belongs to this family of uh, explorations of how we can think about the skyscraper and urban density in a different way. Bangkok is a city I, I know since uh, over 16 years. Um, I used to uh, live there for a while when I organized 
what was one of the largest um, exhibitions in the world on, South, on, on uh, um, architecture and urbanism, basically. It was called Cities on the Move, um, the vision that indeed cities would be what dominate uh, our lives uh, in, in the future. And I think really since the end of the past century or millennium, we have seen an enormous uh, increase of the importance that cities have almost over countries and with that um, of the models that cities provide uh, for our uh, joint and communal life. Having been designing projects that sort of stand out, CCTVU is a project that of course has um, uh, defined much of what uh, Beijing's image has become today, uh, if not China. Um, this, is, uh, th this project, in a way, confronted us with uh, a very uh, specific and different situation. Bangkok is uh, an incredible city. It's a very powerful city. It's a very energetic and active city. And it's a city that um, not only lives of its uh, incredible compression and density, but also of its uh, really uh, spectacular architecture. Um, it has buildings that look like robots. Uh, buildings that look like uh, extrusions from the most abstract uh, version of a drawing board, uh, buildings that seem to float like UFOs um, above uh, the city, um, buildings that uh, took Louis XIV on steroids, um, extruded them uh, along uh, the beautiful river. Uh, and of course, this, this entire tension of the city between the future and the past as it coexists, maybe more pronounced than in almost any other city I know in the world, uh, I think is a very uh, special quality the city has. But how could you design a special building in a city where everything is special already? Of course, um, it felt like a, a very um, daunting question. And of course, also our site in this case was indeed so small and the density so large that we could only built a real tower uh, for once. And I thought if everything is so special, maybe we should uh, be extremely boring instead and do nothing and just take a little square and extrude it. But of course, this image very beautifully uh, for me and very simply um, manifests the problem with the tower. It is essentially scaleless. It is a building that, uh, or a building type that no longer exists in connection to its inhabitants. It is a totem, a mute shaft that absorbs the life of the city and in most cases gives very little back to the city. It internalizes all activity. It sucks it up in this giant uh, object and totem that stands in the city. But my question is, how could we reconnect the tower in a much more explicit way? to its public domain? How could we take the activity of the people that inhabit a building and project it back to the city and the public domain um, as uh, its image and as its experience? So, in other words, how could we find the human scale again in the scale of the tower? So I took this large object and shaft and started to erode it, started to pixelate a series of much smaller uh, elements that would spiral uh, around the building and start to introduce um, the scale of human inhabitation to the size of the tower. And this image looking from the top shows quite beautifully the scale of the historic city still partly surrounding the project in its actual reality and the way in which this pixelated texture basically continues the urban fabric vertically up uh, into the sky. If you look at the building from afar, it seems almost unfinished. It seems that there are parts missing, but as you look closer, you understand this is not a formal gesture, but it is actually about creating three-dimensional space of life and of living. Living rooms, balconies, terraces that project uh, out towards the city and that uh, create a far more active and interactive space for inhabitation than any typical tower could. Suddenly on the 70th floor of a skyscraper, we're able to offer a 300 square foot terrace, a life that is both inside and outside. And of course, this tower is situated in the Asian tropics where throughout the year temperatures are such that you can actually um, occupy outdoor space at any given time. And this sense of 
three-dimensional reality of interactive space and of the, the usage of the space um, that forms the image of the building for me became the most powerful statement possible uh, about a tower um, that would still rise skywards. And of course the emotions that are captured in that of floating above the city and engaging the space of the city uh, in this explicit way I think uh, manifest uh, a new power of what uh, living and uh, existing in, in such heights could possibly mean. I think the issue of the tower is not only in its shaft, it's not only the height of the object itself, but of course it also exists at its base. How does a tower connect to the city at the very point where it actually intersects with the city? Most towers, particularly in that part of the world, are straddled either by a large shopping mall or a parking deck. Essentially elements that completely divorce the building from the public domain of the city and from their activity. And I wanted to not only dissolve the tower, I also wanted to dissolve this heavy element at the bottom and continue um, uh, the way in which the tower engages its public environment. So instead of a single large base, I was looking for a way to split out the base, to separate out part of its volume and actually open up a space between those two elements. So the pixelated texture actually continues in what you could almost describe like a valley of terraces between a smaller uh, cube-like building and the main podium of the tower. And the sense was really that instead of creating a podium that repels the city or excludes the city, we would create a multi-layered uh, active space that would engage uh, the space of the public and continue it into the building. We were also thinking of a transition from the extreme um, onslaught of, of urban intensity uh, that exists in these cities and to transition from that into a more tropical um, and livable environment inside this, what we could essentially call an outdoor atrium of urban activity and gardens. And you see some of the uh, views as you approach the building from um, the SkyTrain station uh, adjacent to it uh, and a sense of communication that suddenly emerges um, within these spaces, uh, carefully programmed uh, terraces with cafes, restaurants, all kinds of outdoor activities that would celebrate um, the space of the public and uh, the space as an interactive domain. This is the small building that we separated out. The, the cube, you can see um, a, a large scaffold on its sides, in a way a reference um, to the many um, billboards and, and scaffoldings that exist in the city that I've always admired here used to support uh, a large um, uh, uh, media screen that faces the city, that faces the, the train, but also by compressing um, the required program in these two volumes, we're able to liberate a large part of the site and give this part back to the city as a public domain, as a public space, that uh, in itself is activated by the various uh, components around it. This huge scaffold acts like a stage tower, basically, with lighting installations and sound um, to host uh, a range of activities um, in this uh, kind of pocket of, of public activity. This is how the tower um, almost stands today. However, this is still one of the uh, computer-generated uh, uh, images. Um, and the work on the facades, of course, the uh, relationship between uh, the shaft of the tower and this opening up was uh, very important. Again, these are physical models we built to test out um, how we could really uh, express the difference between the animated pixels and the shaft of the facade. And this is actually a real photograph. You can see the construction crane uh, and sense how absolutely close uh, reality is to the projected uh, design of it. And you can also see that um, the facade of the main tower is not simply a dull, flat curtain wall, uh, but in itself a three-dimensionally articulated uh, um, uh, texture, which we call cassette facades, um, in these uh, almost bay window-like moments that in themselves uh, become uh, an explicit engagement of the city. And here are a few close-ups uh, of the construction and as the three-dimensionality of this world 
uh, emerges uh, in the tower and both uh, the abstract power that is visible already now and the life that will soon inhabit the building itself. The building accommodates um, a mixture of programs. Uh, it's, uh, it is primarily residential in the upper floors, the Ritz-Carlton residences. Um, at the base, uh, the uh, Edition Hotel uh, by Ian Schrager and Marriott Group um, um, provides uh, hotel accommodation. Um, at the ground, uh, a series of um, uh, retail and other commercial functions activate uh, the public space. And at the very top, um, we're designing uh, public access to what will be the tallest building uh, in Bangkok. Um, this is a matrix of the different floor plans. As you can see, this pixelated texture in a way activates uh, each floor in a unique and special way. So there's not the typical repetition and boredom of the tower where each floor is exactly the same as the other one, but where it is really um, a diverse uh, living environment for the inhabitants of the building. We also looked at how to design apartments. Um, and as parts of the tower are three-dimensionally very active and others are calmer, um, we here uh, um, did a design for a duplex apartment that in itself is almost like a pixel structure, a sculpture that stands in the space um, of, uh, of the tower. You see these two cantilevering volumes, which are essentially the two bedrooms. In the stem in the middle is the back of house and, and the wet kitchen and around it is a flow of um, a living space in itself. And here you see the, the realized uh, apartment um, of this white sculpture uh, and how the space uh, in double height, almost an eight meter tall living room uh, inside the tower flows through. And here you see the, the, the texturality of the cassette facade that you saw from the outside um, in its beauty from, from the inside. Um, the stair that goes up um, on the side uh, of this sculptured uh, uh, element um, and that then splits up almost more like a villa in the sky. It is not really an apartment, but two split level living uh, uh, bedrooms in a very uh, kind of uh, privatized way. Uh, also here, the spatial diversity um, that was very important for us um, to express the space. And this is the study room um, overlooking the living room and of course, looking out of the windows, uh, and this will be the view uh, indeed from some of these apartments at close to 300 meters height uh, in Bangkok. In order to achieve what we, what we did, um, we had to do, of course, a bit of work. At the very beginning, um, the zoning laws, which by the way are interestingly enough very similar uh, to those of, of this city. Although the texture of Bangkok is, of course, it is not a gridded city. It has a lot of very different components, but um, interestingly enough, the zoning laws function quite similarly. So there is a, a kind of setback requirement uh, that one would have to deal with. And we saw um, that the initial studies would have allowed a tower of uh, about 228 meters only on the site. We figured that by uh, basically combining our architectural ambition of dissolving the base and splitting the project into two uh, different entities, we were able to uh, uh, apply a different zoning uh, uh, law to the project and push the tower itself up to 314 meters, thus making it the tallest building in the country. And here you can see, in a way, the governing uh, setback line um, from the center of the main road to the tower. The tower will by a bit indeed be the tallest, um, but it was not necessarily that our ambition, but of course to give the highest degree of quality um, to the building itself. This was again a computer generated uh, image at the outset of the project, and this is an iPhone photo I took a few weeks ago um, in Bangkok, and you see the similarity uh, yet of the vision and of the reality. This is no longer computer, but all real. These are photographs of the building um, as it is uh, rising indeed uh, in the city of Bangkok. And you see the, the kind of expressive difference of this three-dimensionality of space and uh, actually the presence of scale um, of these elements uh, of the building as it rises in the city. We were not only doing the architecture, we also, and, and the project I think for me is, is one of the most powerful uh, examples of what one can make happen 
in um, a true sense of collaboration. Uh, I, I have to say, uh, I, I think this is one of the best clients I've uh, ever worked with uh, in my life. Um, and the, the collaboration with that client, of course, is uh, totally responsible for what we have achieved and, and what is being built. And, and that really, uh, I think, expanded um, the thinking about the project away from a piece of development uh, or a piece of architecture to something that was about the city and about a vision of what we could give this incredible city that is uh, his home, but one of my uh, favorites. The name of the project in a way embodies that in, in quite a powerful way. Mahana Khan is the second uh, part of the Thai name for Bangkok, and it actually stands for Great Metropolis. And we took this name because it was really about embodying the power of the Great Metropolis of the city, and in a way uh, manifesting it uh, in this project. You can see the design itself is also, it's a missing pixel. Uh, inside the logo and we, we said this pixel could be a space that can assume all kinds of things to happen inside of it, like in the building. So all the brands that actually go into the building from the Ritz-Carlton residences and others um, that would indeed uh, become part of what this uh, project manifests as a reality. Um, the client brought Dinit De Luca to Southeast Asia for the first time and uh, we, we put a cafe into our sales gallery, which became so incredibly uh, successful that it was the beginning of a whole uh, national franchise of this brand. Um, some of the best restaurants in the world uh, have already opened uh, in the project. Um, Vogue has uh, launched their first ever lounge uh, inside. And really with this sense of programming and um, uh, defining not only the physical space, but ultimately also the activities in the building, I think we've made uh, a very significant contribution to what story the building will ultimately tell. It received uh, a lot of attention um, th from, from the media. The New York Times repeated, uh, uh, um, reported several times on it. It was leading a double-page spread in the how to spend it section on uh, Asian property. And uh, it, in a way, accomplished that simply because it's a building that has a story to tell. A story to tell about um, uh, the idea how public life can not only uh, um, em embrace a building, but how a building itself can project the message of its public quality and, and meaning to the city back out into the urban realm. Of course, the very top of a tower is always important. Mostly these days, and we see many examples where the top is occupied by a decorative piece, an antenna that makes a 300 meter building be 500 meters high, or a kind of sculptural something that again tries to add identity instead of add function. We thought we keep this building very straightforward. We chop off the top at exactly the right height, and we make uh, a roof terrace that is uh, accessible to the public in what will be one of the largest uh, and tallest 360 degree viewing platforms actually in the world. The viewing platform itself will be uh, comparable to that of Empire State uh, to give you uh, a sense of scale. And these are the buildings you see and their, their public viewing decks highlighted uh, where you realize that actually height is not always um, equal to accessibility. Um, the, the idea of uh, adding an observation deck to this building uh, seemed uh, not only obvious but incredibly exciting uh, because again um, it allows us to further uh, mesh the building uh, uh, with the public domain and allow people to experience um, the excitement that the tallest tower in Bangkok will create. We have two levels of uh, interior observation deck. We have a um, uh, a sky bar uh, that takes up uh, the, the concept of pixelation also inside the building so that when you enter the building you can still comprehend its three-dimensional ambition and finally at the very top the space unfortunately a bit dark the two levels of a gallery level of the observation deck um, the sky bar itself and uh, the open rooftop uh, again with complete 360 degree views all around. Here you sense the pixels of the sky bar element uh, here inhabitable uh, to the public and at the very top um, the, the roof which we felt 
we should not only be on top of the tower, but really add a little feature if you pay attention to the very top here that almost slides out. And uh, we created um, an element uh, spanning the entire width of the building that projects uh, out from the building as a single sheet of glass um, that will uh, ultimately float 310 meters above the city below. We believe, of course, this will be a moment uh, not only for the iPhone generation, um, but certainly uh, for much fun to be had um, if you can uh, feel vertigo uh, of that scale. The building has been growing step by step. Um, we are very excited uh, to see it come alive. This is the media wall on the cube uh, facing the um, SkyTrain station. Uh, and a few more images um, of the building and the pixels as they rise. This is, this is the pixelated structure of the small cube building and the tower um, as it rises above its multifold context of historic references of tight urban density and of a building um, that will soon uh, start to live in this incredible city. Thank you.